Everybody, John here, and today onto the garage, I'm doing a long-awaited 10,000-mile review on my XJ358 Blue. And in amongst that, I'll do my traditional specs scores, so that uh, you guys can compare your opinions with mine, and as we score for fun this model of car. For those of you unfamiliar with the channel, To The Garage is a channel all about tinkering around and playing in your garage, enjoying yourself, very automotive themed and heavily biased towards Jaguars. Long term viewers will know I am completely enamoured with the XK8. So you may say, what am I doing with this big old barge? of an HJ6L. Blue, which is this car's name, joined my little fleet because I needed for my work a vehicle I could smash out huge miles in. My XK8 is more than capable of doing that, but she's 25 years old and has only done 46,000 miles. So I didn't really want to destroy her going backwards and forwards to my various places of work. And so the idea was born to get a bit of a project car that would be fun, interesting, economical, comfortable, and um, not cost a lot to buy in the first place. So what did I go for? A Jaguar XJ limousine. So blue was a very cheap car to buy she cost me a little over £3,000. Bought privately. First clue is she had no service history. She had been serviced rather well at the beginning of her life, but the last couple of years or so, not so, and all of the documentation had been lost. So that reduced her value. Next, she had a series of known faults including having uh, run over a half house brick which had gone round inside the front right wheel arch and basically ripped out half of the front wheel arch and damaged the cooling pipe. Next, she's an L. L for limousine or L for long. Um, so she is even longer than a standard XJ. And for an awful lot of people, that's a huge put off because if you're even slightly intimidated by the idea of parking, owning, driving a large car, then one that comes with an extra six inches or so of length is not gonna be on your to, to get list. Next, she's a 2.7 twin turbo diesel. Diesel and Jag, for some people, shouldn't go together. I've owned three Jaguar diesels and I've loved every single one of them. So for me, it wasn't a problem. And finally, old luxury cars devalue. Unless they are Bugattis or something else that's very collectible, they really do depreciate fast. So that's why I managed to buy this car for £3,000. She had done at the time 145,000 miles. And the reason for making this video now is she's done 155,000 miles. So I've had her for a little under six months. And considering COVID has somewhat curtailed travel, I've still managed to clock up 10,000 miles in it. A little bit of background on the model. What we're sat in is known as an XJ6. 
six cylinder XJ. It's a 2008 car. That makes it an X350, but more precisely, this is an X358. X350 is a code name for the entire project. And this design of car was initially looked after by Jeff Lawson, who brought to us, along with his great team, the XK8 or X100. And he brought along the very smooth flowing lines, the uh, retro look, the fuselage body language, which means that the bodywork viewed from the front, the sides curve out and then back in underneath. Far more pronounced on the X100, but it's still there on 350. Before the project was finished, Jeff unfortunately died and another one of Jaguar's legendary design chiefs stepped in, Ian Callum, who's famous for things like the XF. And this was the first car that he really had great influence on and he finished the project off. The X358 is a facelift for the last two and a half years of the model. So you can get an X358 that's registered uh, 2007, 8 or 9. And an X358 is also known as the box bumpered Jaguar XJ. And is basically the same car with lots of minor upgrades and additions. Um, but chief amongst them is a styling upgrade including much more aggressive boxier front and rear bumpers the air intake gill or power vent as it is called many people say he was very influenced by the broad speed jaguar xjc This car was produced from 2003 through and is the successor to the X308, which was the last steel bodied XJ. Although this looks like a design evolution, same sort of flowing lines, it's a major, major departure from that previous design. This shares nothing with the previous bar a few badges and the odd bit of uh, interior trim. Um, Jaguar IRS back end, there'd been lots of evolutions and variations of it, moving from inboard discs to outboard discs. This car's got a different setup, albeit fully independent, but this car's got air suspension, cats built in as standard, which is Jaguar's reactive damping system. The entire vehicle is made from aluminium. There are some um, high strength, low weight steels included in some areas for crash protection, but the structure is aluminium, making it one of the very first all aluminium cars in the world. The later, and as it turned out last, version of the XJ, the vehicle that is most common on our roads now, is a heavy revision of this car. So the styling and bodywork is completely upgraded to look more like what you would expect from Ian Callum and his XF type designs, but beneath the skin it's still this. So with a little bit of background, Let's jump straight into the specs scores. For those of you new to the channel, when we're able to do a 10,000 mile review of a vehicle, we give it a spec score. It's subjective, but it is my complete and honest opinion. I'm not trying to sell you a car, I'm not a garage, I'm not a dealer, I'm an enthusiast, but I'm very honest and very realistic. So the acronym specs 
stands for safety, performance, practicality, economy, comfort, and soul. And for me, that's how I define and judge a car. There's not a lot else going on. So safety. First and sort of novel thing to check out from a safety point of view is if you look up the NCAP, Euro NCAP ratings for this vehicle and in fact its successor, you'll find they've never been tested. And that's because of the expense of these vehicles being very high. So the Euro NCAP organization not really feeling inclined to get hold of the vehicles and destroy them. But also the expectation that there will be very niche and relatively low volume. But without that scientific um, score, we can still look at the XJ and with a clinical mind, look at the features where it's got to keep you safe and the experiences that people have had in terms of um, get walking away from crashes and recognise that it is inherently a very safe car. It has safety features which are not completely overshadowed today. So multiple airbags, including curtain airbags and seat airbags, which mean it protects the occupants not only from the full on front shunt, but from glass showering, from side intrusion, submarining, which is where you slide down a seat and underneath the steering wheel. It's all there. It's got everything you'd expect in terms of safety systems like ABS, electronic stability control. Um, it's, it's all in place at this stage. The rear seats have ISO fix, fixing points for child seats. Jaguar's art system is pretty developed by this stage, meaning that it can sense where the occupants are, the nature and severity of an incident, and deploy the airbags and safety systems uh, seatbelt pretensioners, etc., according to where the occupants are and how bad the crash is. The structure is aluminium, which forced the designers to look at um, side intrusion bars, extra strengthening in the nose and the crumpled zones very carefully, which probably means that there was more effort put into those sorts of things than on the average car where they knew how to do it and internal testing of the car has proved it to be very, very safe. And for all those who have been unfortunate enough to be in a big accident in an aluminium XJ, the experience generally tends to have been, I made a good choice, it may have saved my life. And some of that, let's be fair, comes from size. But as a lot of car, you're gonna be further from the impact point there is more space for defamation, etc., etc. But whichever way you look at it, this is a safe car. It does not have the stamp of approval of Euro NCAP, and safety is constantly moving on. So it would be childish of me to say that this is a 10 pointer. You know, we're getting on for 15 years old. I think I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 for safety. Let's go next to performance. Obviously there's a big range of engines and specs available on these cars. Um, so just to address that first of all, I've got a 2.7 twin turbo diesel. You could also get a 3 litre V6 petrol and you can get two sizes of V8 petrol plus you can get supercharged V8 petrol. And once you're up there at the V8 supercharged petrol, this car 
is a rocket ship and would have been the fastest four-door saloon in the world for a few months before the next competitor pipped it to the post. But I can only give you my owner's experience if I base it on this one. So performance-wise, this gives about 200 horsepower, which is not huge. However, the torque is fantastic. And you would need a supercharged V8 version to have more torque than this diesel unit. So it does not feel slow. Admittedly, 0-60 is eight seconds. And eight seconds is not fast by modern standards. The supercharged V8s will do it in five. However, cruising like I am on a motorway, effortlessly at 70, when I want to go around somebody as quickly as possible, the diesel kicks you in the back probably harder than the V8 petrols do because it's that instantaneous torque and their low revving quality means that they feel very under stressed at all times. Don't get me wrong, the performance of the supercharged V8 taken as a whole is far superior. Some of the performance of a car is not just its acceleration though. And day to day, most of us aren't running around with a stopwatch. It's how it feels, it's how it drives, is it sporting, is it going to be fun, all that sort of good stuff. Um, so the performance of the car, I would say, is it gives a lot more sporting drive than its looks suggest. And actually, because it's so large, it feels even quicker than it is. If you drive a very small car that's got a decent engine, it'll scare you because it feels like it's faster than it's able or faster than it deserves to be and it feels extreme. This car is huge, but it's still very lively. It can still kick and go. Um, the handling is very good. I've driven X308s and X358s and the contrast between them is quite interesting. The X308 has a much lower stance. It sits lower on the road and therefore feels far more um, overtly sporting and chuckable to the extent that you're less surprised by its handling. I would hazard a guess that this would generate more G than a 308 because of the air suspension, the cats, the extra width and track, um, the reduced unsprung weights, the way that it holds the road means that this is probably the sharper tool but it hides some of that rather well as well with sophistication so it takes away a little bit of the excitement the gearbox is a good six speed zf auto but in diesel format i've got to say it doesn't really encourage you to use the j gate and shift yourself for that extra entertainment it's just too competent in auto and the shifts are short so you can never be in a gear for many seconds um, if you're playing if you're if you're enjoying yourself so I would say that's less of an enjoyable experience than on a petrol car um, and less of an enjoyable experience than on a ZF5 speed in an X308 brakes very good 
very sharp. Um, it has an emergency braking assist system which can catch you out now and again in that if you tap the brake pedal like going along a motorway and you think oh I'll just screw a bit of speed because I've seen a change in speed limits it can um, slam the nose down a little bit more than you anticipate. The handbrake is electronically operated and is adequate. Uh, it's better than the lever operated uh, drumming disc units that are on earlier cars. If you really push this car it's got a few performance tricks um, and that includes once it detects sus sustained high speed the suspension lowers so fully adjustable air suspension running on an algorithm it detects aggressive and fast driving and drops the car at speed and that reduces the drag and improves stability so that's quite cool so I think the upshot on performance is my 146 mile an hour 8 second 0 to 60 diesel limousine actually produces a lot more entertainment than diesel limousine would suggest and makes it actually a really good fun car to drive. I wouldn't put it out there as a performance machine but if you went for an XJR version of this car or a Super V8 then that's a different kettle of fish and I would say that it is a Q car or sleeper car at that stage in that it is extraordinarily capable of good performance yet in a Savile Row suit. I'm going to give my car, Blue, a 7 for performance because the ultimate measure of performance is how much fun it gives you in the environment that you're going to be running it in. And I can have a lot of fun in this. I've definitely had faster and more fun cars and I would definitely say my XK8 is more fun but this is a good car so seven for performance specs is spelt with a double p why because i needed it to be the other p is practicality what's it like to live with from a sensible stuff point of view I think I've got a really good handle on its practicality because of the amount of miles I do. And I probably use this car more for what it is intended, unless your intention is to sit in the back, than most people do. I smash out huge miles in it. I fill the boot with all sorts of stuff. I occasionally use the back as an office to work out of. And it's also family transport, running errands, popping to the shops. So what's it like at all that? It's got sat-nav. The sat-nav is tolerable. That's to do with its age. It would have been quite good when the car came out, not leading, but it's slow and can't be updated to the current road system. So, you've got to say that that's it's there it means you don't have to use your phone or a separate sat nav system things like the hi-fi in this car is fantastic i've got 3d surround sound um, amplified system and the sound is spot on talking of sound the car is double glazed all round um, that's an optional thing. I think it's standard on some specific models, but um, it does cut down on wind noise. Uh, it can be a precursor to getting a uh, Sentinel spec. Sentinel is the name that Jaguar use for 
they're bulletproof, armoured security vehicles, if you like. Um, but it also means, of course, it's harder to break into. Interior cubby space, etc., is probably a little lacking for a car of this size. So I have two cup holders here. Thankfully, by this stage, Jaguar had abandoned the flip out armrest cup holders and gone for something slightly more conventional with this slide back adjustable armrest that can cover these cup holders. The door pockets are very usable but not overly big and the glove box is again it's a useful size but it's not a cavernous thing because there's a lot of stuff in the architecture behind it. Aircon is not only dual zone, but split front rear. So it's basically four zone or quad zone aircon. And this is a XJL limousine. So there are a full set of controls in the rear, including heated seats in the rear. In the rear, we've also got TVs. So a lot of people, if they've got children, will want to fit screens to the backs of their headdress to keep them occupied. These are integrated into the car and built in. From the negative point of view, they are analog TV tuners. And if you live in the UK, there are no analog um, TV channels left. So it can't pick up TV channels. But you have um, phono lines in to that system, meaning you can connect it uh, via various adapters to a games console, to your phone, to a DVD player, um, to Netflix on a Fire Stick, something like that. So again, totally usable. And there's a full set of radio and CD and phone controls in the rear, including microphones mounted in the uh, headlining. So fabulous news for rear seat passengers whether they be captains of industry or children. The boot or trunk is large. We're talking 450 litres. So by comparison with any average saloon car or sedan, it's going to be very good. It actually lags behind its contemporary rivals from Mercedes and BMW and certainly those from Rolls and Bentley. Um, but that's the compromise to this being a sporting Executive Express. The floor is a little higher in this because it's accommodating that sporting suspension. Um, they try to keep the profile low and sleek so the boot line is not maybe as high as on some of its competitors and there is a lot of technology packed into the liners behind the sides of the uh, car. It seats five. The seats in the back are not shaped just for four, as is in the case on some models. And the middle seat it is not too much of a compromise either, other than having your legs either side of a transmission tunnel. Um, the back seat is quite wide and very comfortable, even in the centre. It's dead easy to get into a good seating position, as we said, and a good seating position in this results in being able to almost see the front of the car. If your car's fitted with a leaper on the front, as many do, then you can basically judge the front very, very well. The back on this car is a long way away from you and is not easy to judge. You can't see it out of the rear window, it's below the um, rear window line. This car is fitted with parking sensors, which really are an essential. And I've added a reversing camera that's um, using a monitor instead of a rear view mirror, because I do find it hard to reverse into spaces and judge because of the length. And also, the rear view mirror on my car is pretty much pointless because I have limousine glass, which if you're not familiar is 
um, dark oven sort of standard uh, security or privacy glass meaning effectively is totally one way um, but also means you can see next to nothing looking out the rear window by the time you take into effect the tinting effect of the mirror the tint on the rear window the rear window's a long way away etc etc and that's kind of linked to the only of a severe practicality down point is parking and storage maybe this is a long car it won't fit in the average council garage parking spaces are tight with most cars in the UK this one's pushing the limits it's not extravagantly wide but it's as wide as a standard car will be the doors are not too bad on the front in terms of how wide they open to get out but on the L model the limousine model the rear doors are very long and sometimes our younger rear seat passengers will not be the most conscientious when it comes to getting out without knocking things so rear access can be an issue heated front screen absolute boon making it very practical for winter mornings and on this model we've also got an auxiliary heater meaning as soon as the engine starts and we detect that the temperature is low enough rather than waiting for the engine to heat the water there's a separate water heater diesel powered that kicks in and a little exhaust plume appears from underneath uh, the front right hand corner of the car which is quite interesting so practicality of this car is a mixed bag it's not got anything that an estate car could give the parking is a pain door opening and things like that the infotainment etc is rather last generation there's not a single USB to be found anywhere unless you fit your own adapters and um, you'll probably need to upgrade Bluetooth um, devices to allow you to get media into the head unit <clears throat> and yet it's a thoroughly usable car whilst pulling off the other tricks of luxury car, interesting car, quite a nice car to drive, all those sorts of things. But I've got to be got to be really stern with myself and say, so I'm going to give it seven. Economy. Now here's one where it should fall over. So let's play the positives first. And the positive is blue is a diesel. And for some people that's a complete non-starter because they don't like diesels or Jag and diesel doesn't go together for them and that's, you know, that's fine. That's choices. For me it was one of the key reasons I bought this car. The Lion engine, which is the name for this, is a joint Ford Peugeot venture and has produced a really good engine that ultimately has been very reliable over a number of years in a number of cars. You can get the same engine for instance in an early XF or in an S-Type. So there is a certain economy that goes with the fact that this is a reliable engine and there are plenty of those engines out there in the Jaguar fleet or car park. The next one is the actual fuel economy. Now whenever I talk about economy in the context of Jags I get a flotilla of comments saying why on earth are you talking about economy John? It's a Jag. You don't buy a Jag if you need economy. No, no I get that. I do understand that. Also I understand other people's comments about it's only a few pennies. You don't live in the UK if you're saying that. So our fuel's expensive and I drive a lot of miles. So to me, it matters. This car genuinely has never returned me less than 40 to the gallon. 
Some of that is aided by the fact I drive it in the way it was intended. I do big miles. I do relatively quick miles. Shan't explore that statement any further. Um, but equally, I'm not thrashing the car and ragging it within an inch of its life. So I'm helping it out in that regard, but it's done 155,000 miles and it's still doing today. We've averaged 42 miles per gallon over the last 100 miles. That's brilliant. That's really good. So there's that side of it. Other positives. This car cost me £3,000. Now I got a very good deal because it had some issues. But if you were shopping with a budget of £5,000, there'd be a lot of cars out there for you to choose from. They may have a few foibles, but £5,000 is buying you a lot of car. Insurance. I'm a grown-up, so that helps me no end. And I live in a nice area of the country with relatively low crimes. But the cost of insuring this is going to be two to three hundred pounds fully comp unlimited mileage with business use for most of you so that's where that really stacks up to be good on economy let's head into the grey area servicing and repairs from a straightforward service and repair point of view, the stuff that you should be doing every 12 months, there's nothing on this car that means it's particularly difficult for the average Joe who's half decent with DIY to be able to do himself or herself on the driveway. The one foible is that you've got to undo a big plastic under tray to get at a few bits and pieces. But, you know, it's not bad at all. Filters, oils, etc. Changing brakes, pads, even discs. There's no big deal on this car. So you can do it yourself. And the prices of the parts to do that are very reasonable and not unrelated to, if we use the Mondeo as a sort of benchmark of vanilla, full-sized saloon. Where that same equation becomes far more expensive is if you're not that way inclined or have the space, then Jaguar dealers are expensive places to go to. So servicing through a dealership of this car will be more expensive than a Mondeo. It's as simple as that. And whilst they'd be capable of doing it, some garages, which are not Jaguar garages, would turn up their nose or add on a few quid if you asked them to service one of these because they wouldn't know what to expect. It's an older car, it's a Jaguar, that rhymed. Um, so, you know, you're going to get charged more, simple as that. But again, if you find a good independent, none of that's a problem. Into the more expensive areas, some of the parts for Jaguars are very expensive. They don't share a lot with other cars and other brands, uh, because as we discussed at the beginning, they are that unique biggest small volume car producer their cars are pretty much unique designs a few exceptions um, Lincoln Town car was an S type for instance um, but in the main if it's a Jag it's a Jag so some of the parts are expensive and you've got to factor in that some of them will break it's also a complex car with non-standard wiring, multiplexed, 
um, lots of additional features and luxury features which can go wrong and in the UK now, our MOT says if it's fitted, it should work. So if there's an error light on the dashboard for tire pressure sensors and they're fitted, then they have to be fixed. So it's another complexity, it's another thing to go wrong. And there are a lot of electrical systems and devices and heater systems and valves and the rear entertainment systems and all that sort of stuff. There are lots of bits to go wrong on these. And there are some parts which are really hard to obtain. So for instance, I would like a new headlining, but it's a limousine. So the headlining's longer than everybody else's. So that becomes expensive and difficult to do. And technically you've got to take the rear window out to do it, although I'm sure I could do that. Their use of brakes and pads I would say is comparable with anything else on the road that's reasonably large and automatic. Automatics tend to use their brakes and pads far more. I changed everything on this car when I got it and I would say I am one third worn on my brakes and pads after 10,000 miles. So we're going to get about 30,000 miles which is two to three years for most people, um, for me rather less, out of a set of pads let's say. But it's not expensive to change. Tyres, if the car is not set up well, you will burn through tyres fast. They're wide, they're relatively soft, the car is relatively a heavy car, although it's light for its size. Um, and it is capable of some quite remarkable handling, which means you tend to try and explore that and push on round islands and that sort of thing. So you will scrub tires on the outside edges. So you may find your tire mill relatively high and you don't have the option of fitting cheapo, cheapo, cheapo tires to these cars because of the speed and load ratings. It tends to be decent tires that you're gonna be fitting. So things like tires are gonna be more expensive. I've had a lot of small errors and faults to fix on this car because cheap bought, no service history, etc. But I've got to say, it's not felt unreliable. I've had one thing go wrong which you could consider normally would have been a breakdown where a plastic water pipe split. Um, I managed to drive the car home and um, sorted out at my pace. That could have been a recovery in the wrong circumstances. But other than a flat tyre, nothing else has gone wrong with it, which is what I would consider a breakdown. So where do we stand on economy? If you're already looking at interesting and therefore not vanilla cars, servicing cost and parts prices are immediately higher and I found this to be, in all of the regards, not an expensive experience. So, a bit of a mixed bag, but I'm gonna give Blue the XJ a seven out of 10 for economy. Well, the comfort side of it is nailed on. You are not gonna find too many cars which are more comfortable than this one. You're just not. It doesn't matter about the age of the vehicle either. It's air suspended, one. Two, have you seen how thick the seats are? The late model, like this one, X358s, have bigger, more plush, more comfortable seats than the earlier cars. Um, from a styling point of view, you may prefer the look of the early ones. I'm kind of ambivalent, the two styles I, I can't really get a preference on, but these are more comfortable. The seats are heated, in a lot of cars they'll have massage functions, they're electrically movable in every direction, including being able to extend the length of the squab, or base of the seat, without 
the crumb tray, as I would call it, that BMW introduce. Um, and they basically bring the front edge of the seat forward because it's got a bit of a pleat in it. And when you adjust that to match what you like, it leaves this sort of trough that collects your crumbs. That's the way it feels to me anyway. Up front, um, I'm very comfortable. The ergonomics are fantastic. And I've got a fully adjustable, electrically adjustable steering wheel for height and reach. But fascinatingly and not common, I have a fully adjustable pedal box. So I'm able to move the pedals forwards and backwards in the footwell from the steering wheel using this control on the side. That's not common. That's a real luxury feature and means if you can get your seating position to be perfect. And the leg room in the back is obviously going to be off the scale good. This is a limousine. There are removable Wilton carpets if you haven't got lamb's wool carpets you can kick your legs out in front of you on and you're sitting in a supremely comfortable seat all the burr walnut is real the facings on the seats are real leather so it all wears rather well comfort is obviously where the x358 is going to smash it out of the park it's it's its party piece it's only going to be beaten by things like Citroen DS's, Rolls Royces, etc. Where, to be fair, the Rolls Royce is majoring on that. It can do performance, but yeah, it's not really its bag. And the Citroens, you know, it's a much older car, but. Um, it was majoring on comfort and style. So for comfort, I would give Blue, the X358, a 10 out of 10. I'm not really able to see what we could do to improve the situation. And I certainly couldn't afford to replace it with anything more comfortable. The final category is the hardest to define and if most of us are honest with ourselves the most important one in terms of buying keeping loving a car and that's s for soul what's the car like how does it make you feel do you love it is it a person have you named it all that stuff but it's the difference between it's a fridge and it's a person. I scored my XK8 convertible as a 10 out of 10 for soul. For me, that is the epitome of a car with soul. I love everything about it. Even its foibles make me smile. I look forward to driving it. It's an event, all that sort of good stuff. So that's my benchmark. Is this the same? Does it have the same degree of soul? The simple answer is no. But is this a fridge? No. Um, I've had a couple of offers from others to buy this car off me. They know what I've paid for it. I've been offered considerably more than I paid for it because the bodywork is in very good condition. It's a nice color combination and it has most of the toys. And despite its 155,000 miles, there are people out there who would like to buy it. And I can easily get another one. I can probably buy one really cheap again. Um, I could try out something else, but I am resistant and there's no logic to that. I'm just kind of enjoying the car at the moment. We're way past worrying about its mileage. It's done a lot of miles. There's almost a part of me that wants to run it to 200,000. 
because that's a badge of honour rather than an issue. That suggests it's got a bit of soul about it. I really like the looks. As my friend Gareth, who very often joins in with comments on the channels, will uh, attest, we've had many a good good debate about the relative merits of the look of this car, the aluminium XJ, with its predecessor, the steel XJ, the X308. And I think we both agree the X308, which he owns, is the cooler looking car. It's lower, it's sleeker, it's, it looks like it's probably more aggressive. Um, yeah, it's the better look, it's a prettier car. It is, to quote Gareth, more gangster. <laughs> However, I think the X358 versus the X350 with it, um, the X358 is the box bumpers, sills, twin grills on the front, other embellishments, tiny little boot spoiler of no consequence. It's just slightly more aggressive. And the power vents on the side, nice wheels. There's something about it that adds an air of aggression um, that gives it a slightly snarly look. And the more I own it, the more I warm to the look while still accepting that the 308 is prettier in my head. I also like the way this car cossets you. It's like a little capsule, you know, you can have a bad day, you jump in it and it's looking after it, it's comfy, it's warm, it's quiet. It's got a bit of personality about it. When you stamp on the throttle, I do like the sound that the diesel makes. It's, I don't know, it's slightly offbeat. It's thrummy. Um, it's quite cool. I like the fact that it's all aluminium as well as the handling package just because I know it's not hiding any red rust. Aluminium cars can corrode, they can corrode badly. But it's kind of a different type of corrosion that will lift paint. And unless it's really gone to town won't MOT fail a car so quickly and that's kind of cool too I wouldn't recommend getting a car with the limo glass like I've got just because it's hard to see out of in the back and from the outside there's a huge contrast between the front side windows and the rear windows because it's illegal in the UK to tint front side windows beyond X level and the backs are extreme. So it gives an odd look, but I must admit that black glass gives it a sort of who's in there look, slightly menacing. I even like the look of my own sticker on the side. <laughs> So this car does have some soul, really does. But it's not XK8 level. And I don't think it's X308 level. This is slightly more the sensible choice than the X308 because of my diesel. Um, it's a hard one to judge. I think this is an eight for soul. It's a far more interesting and soulful car in my opinion for anybody jumps in my opinion than a 7 series BMW or an S class Mercedes it's just got more personality the wooden leather means that no two interiors are identical I like that it looks, I don't know how, it looks British. That's not a xenophobic thing, but I like British things. I don't know what it is. 
it's it's a sort of classicality of design i think you know when this car came out it was slated for looking old it was a missed opportunity and yeah there's a lot of people didn't buy it because of that but there'll be a lot of people like me who went yeah it's still classic jack <laughs> so ah oh, yeah I think this car gets an 8 out of 10 for soul. And I'd try and justify that, but it, it's, it's the unjustifiable category anyway. It's, it's personal. So, that's given you a bit of a overview. And it's given you a spec score. Let's just round off with the 10,000 mile experience. When I first got the car, it had a lot of faults, including big water leaks, um, broken parts, missing parts, etc. So the first couple of thousand miles took me probably two or three months to do because I was not going very far in it. I was doing a little journey, finding the issues, fixing the issues, etc., etc. And I don't think we really bonded. It was interesting, but we didn't really bond over that period. And I'm probably realizing the the level of issue. The experience was mediocre. You know, nice big car came quite cheap. All the rest of it. As the issues have reduced, and the miles have clocked up, I've become more accustomed to the car, more comfortable with the car, start enjoying it more. Um, the fuel consumption is constantly impressed me the comfort I think I only really registered how good it was when I had to swap to a different car for a few days and and that other car was very nice but I didn't feel as fresh when I got out of it and as soon as I got back into this one I thought ah gosh you're good um, the car is constantly drawing positive interest not quite in the same way as the XK8 but I have lots of nice conversations with people who will happily trot over and say this is their favourite look of the Jag because it's the one that looks most like a limo they associate it with Prime Ministers and that sort of thing and they like that look um it's a car I've been on the production line and watched being manufactured, so there's a connection for me there um, for moments in the past. So what have been the parts I've changed, the issues I've had, things I've serviced in the 10,000 miles. So a small caveat before we do this, I bought this car knowing it had issues. So I'm not saying that anybody else who's uh, going to get one of these would typically have this degree of stuff to deal with in 10,000 miles of ownership. <clears throat> but I'll give you exactly as is. So when I bought the car, I immediately had to buy wheel nuts because some of them were missing. It gives you an indication of its uh, previous life. I had to lubricate the check straps and hinges because every door squealed when you opened it. I had to buy a spare key and get it coded and program it so that the remote control would work with the car. I had to remove the head unit from the center console and obtain its serial number and use an online service to get the code for the radio. I had to replace two blown door speakers and put a second hand amplifier in for the audio system. I had to replace one of the metal pipes for the auxiliary heating system uh, that carries the water from the engine to the extra heater. I had to refit all of the fastenings which were supposed to be holding up the under tray, 
because there was only about one third of them in place. I had the um, engine retimed because it was one tooth out and replaced the cam belt. I put a new battery into the car because it's a thing you should do when you buy an older Jaguar. They are incredibly sensitive to poor condition batteries and you should just assume the worst. I had a four wheel tracking done, full alignment, and got everything back to where it should be. I removed the air compressor for the air suspension and replaced the piston ring. I bought a rear view camera system and a mirror monitor and installed that. I bought a lot of adapter leads and connectors to enable the rear multimedia system, the screens to pick up on my mobile phone, my laptop, etc. I replaced the fuel filter, the air filter, the oil filter, the sump plug and washer, changed the oil, having flushed the oil, changed all the fluid in the brake system, replaced the front calipers, front discs and pads, replaced the rear discs and pads and bled the entire system. I had my independent buddy, Neil Muggerston, do, um, he did the cam belt change for me, uh, also did the replacement of the water pipe between the uh, left hand bank of the engine and the suspension tower because I was working at the time and I, I just didn't have the time or opportunity to get at that. I've had two punctures repaired, one tyre scrapped and I've had an alloy wheel straightened. I didn't bend the wheel, it was already bent. And I've also discovered to my cost that the car didn't have a uh, wheel nut wrench in its toolkit. I've washed and cleaned the carpets and, and I've done a temporary repair, where well, it's lasting rather nicely, on the driver's side inner door seal. I had to buy and install a battery clamp as there was none fitted and also fit lenses to the number plate lights at the back. Still to resolve, I have a grubby, although reasonably well attached, headlining. I want to check and replace the oil in the diff. And although I've cleaned the car, I have at no point polished it. So that's something that I want to get round to. So there you are. There are all the bits and pieces that I've done. So the vast majority of that has been down to previous neglect rather than issues with a vehicle. So that kind of completes the uh, review of the vehicle, a 10,000 mile review. My executive summary is that I'm really enjoying owning her. Um, despite all of the stuff I've had to do to her, I still think it's a fabulous value for money. Um, I'm never going to try and bring this car back to pristine. It's more of a Bangonomics style equation for me. Buy the car cheap, do what's necessary and achieve a fast, fun, economical, useful car um, for as little maintenance costs as is possible. But equally, when I say as little as possible, I'm not skimping. I'm, I'm doing the things that need doing. I think the looks are great. They're not as pretty as the previous model, my opinion. The car has weaved its way into my affections um, and I'm getting more and more to enjoy the way it handles and feels, um, but I don't think it'll ever have the draw of my XK8. And that's probably the nature of sports cars anyway. They, they are very personal vehicles. 
but this is also a great car. So that's the end of this video, guys and girls. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm enjoying the X358. I'd love to know your comments on it. Do you love it? Do you hate it? Do you think I should run blue until she's been to the moon and back? Or do you think I should move her on and get a new project? What would that be? What's your experience of ownership been? And if you've got any questions, I'm always more than happy to hear them. So until the next time, see you soon. If you're enjoying our channel, then don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notifications of new videos. And please give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can share the videos. And below the video is always the area where you can comment and get involved with the chat.